Let's get it. This is Life's Essential Ingredients with Jeff and a mic, where we hope to inform, inspire, and transform lives one essential ingredient at a time. Welcome to the show. Listeners, here we go. We back, baby. Me and my Pasha, we back. Uh, we are season three, episode six with A. Garcia coming from an undisclosed location. And first of all, I'm going to just call her Garcia for this episode. Uh, and the best place to find her, she's got two websites, Be Your Incredible Self. Dot com and then her newest one confronting dv.org and that's d as in dog and v as in victor for domestic violence.org so about our guest garcia's personal mission is to lead others in transforming their survival of domestic violence into post traumatic growth Sharing her personal testimony has empowered Garcia to teach her powerful combination of situational awareness and emotional intelligence to her clients, guiding them to take control of their lives. Garcia has dedicated her life to developing transformational programs, various forms of coaching, lifelong learning through various certification courses, and establishing a nonprofit to help victims of domestic violence. Her commitment is to provide lifelong learning, lifelong transformational habits, excuse me, to restore a powerful internal sense of control. Garcia learned that extreme independence is a trauma-driven response and a natural one which can be defeated through focused self-awareness and intentional control. Garcia, thanks for dedicating your life to helping others and thanks for having the courage to endure all that you have and then share that pain with others with the hope and belief you can guide a victim to a new life. Garcia, welcome to the show. Wow. Thank you for having me here. What an honor and a privilege. Uh, yeah, we're excited. I can't believe it. We have listeners in 39 countries, over 550 cities. Uh, and it's been Mike and my honor to just share a little bit of life uh, with people out there. And uh, we've started this uh, podcast to help one person. Uh, and that one person for sure is always me and my Pasho because we're busy taking notes. Uh, and so we're just excited to have you uh, as our guest and to have you share your expertise in your life with the listeners. And we always start with a thought of the day, which is a quote that I picked uh, after researching you. And you're going to like this one. And I think it's going to resonate with you, but the pressure is all on me because uh, we, this is our season three, episode six, and we're a hundred percent on getting these quotes to match up with uh, the guest. And so if I'm off, Hey, just tell me the truth, Jeff, you're way off on this one, but here it is. And it's from your good friend, Brene Brown. Owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as spending our lives running from it. Embracing our vulnerabilities is risky, but not nearly as dangerous as giving up on love and belonging and joy. The experiences that make us the most vulnerable. Only when we are brave enough to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. Why would I pick that one for you? Wow. Because it's very parallel and a perfect metaphor to what my whole life has been. The only thing is, I don't think I've had the choice to go into the dark. It's been out of my control. I just find myself there and then I need to find my way to navigate out. Mm. I'm just writing. I'm always taking. Yeah. So that, let's get into that then real quick. I guess I, I didn't want to get so serious right out of the gate. <laughs> You're talking about, hey, I, I never had any choice and was just in the dark and needed to find uh, my own light in, in order to to lead myself to to other light. So what, what, let's just get into that. What, what does that mean? Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess we can start off from when I was involuntarily pushed into the world. right? <laughs> I mean, that in itself right there, my, my parents were actually married. 
Um, however, it was a toxic relationship. And so I believe that coming into this world, I had already had an exposure to trauma, you know, while my mother was pregnant with me. So uh, shortly after, you know, after my birth, I'll say a couple of years later, two, two and a half years later, my mother um, decided to pack her bags and leave the toxic environment. The unfortunate part is that she left me and my baby sister in that same place she was running from. So almost overnight, well, not yet overnight. So at the age of two, I'm already I'm already having a void with my mother, the nurturer, right? Left in the environment that she was not strong enough uh, to stay in or not strong enough to remove us from as well. And so about six months after her departure, my baby sister was diagnosed with cancer. And then about eight months after her diagnosis, she was taken away. So overnight, I have, as a child, inherited any void, every void humanly possible. My mother's gone. My only sibling is gone. And my dad is checked out. So I have no cousins. And that was my only sibling. And so there I was, this little girl with not not even knowing that I had nothing. So <clears throat> during my during my grammar school years, and by the way, I lived about a mile away from where I had to go to school. And I, I did walk both directions most of the days. But the cemetery was closer to school than where I lived. And where I lived, there was nothing... There was nothing really there for me. So I pretty much at a young age figured out how to be everywhere but home. So I chose every after school program to get into. I would walk to the cemetery after school to do homework and bond where I felt like I had an emotional bond with somebody. I would go to the rec, uh, the rec hall or the, the, you know, city park and do gymnastics, do woodcraft, things that really didn't need a parental signature back then. And um, I started my um, newspaper routes and washing cars and washing clothes and pulling weeds and mowing lawns to put peanut butter and jelly in my kitchen. You know, my dad worked third shift. He slept all day. I was literally on my own. So the streets, the streets raised me. By the time I was a teenager, you couldn't tell me I didn't know anything. You you couldn't tell me that I was not a mature adult ready to face the world. I already had a work ethic. I already knew the neighborhood. I already knew how to get around everywhere. My, my dad moved almost every single year that the lease was up. We had we just moved into another neighborhood. So teenage years where I'm thinking I know it all and, and the you know where I live, there was a lot of game banking. There was a lot of, you know, daytime shooting, school violence. I had to walk through metal detectors just to get into class. So violence had always been this uh, normal thing, you know, obviously being left in that environment. I'm not saying that he was never around and didn't do anything. DCF was at my house every single year, whether it was neighbors calling or teachers calling or whomever calling. I just never got taken away. So I dropped out of high school. I was a I had a teen pregnancy. I was with um, my first love for about five years. And it was it was a very violent relationship. And once I had my my firstborn, I said I was not going to be like any parent I had. I wasn't going to be a, a mother who abandoned their child and I wasn't going to be a checked out parent like my dad was because like life was too hard and you didn't know how to deal with it. And I was not going to expose her to the things that I was exposed to. So I had to find a way to leave that violent situation and be a sole provider and protector. And I did. Um, I put her in the bags with me <laughs> and I took her and, you know, we went to a place where nobody would even look twice. It was a cold basement with no heat. It was cement floor, brick walls. Um, it was just a wide open space with a bathroom and a, and a, a laundry area, but I created it like a, like a studio, you know, I put remnants carpet and had, uh, you know, like the different desks or, you know, counter space that I, that I created. And I went back for my GED. I started, you know, I was raising my daughter on my own. 
I was going into college. So I'm going to fast forward to about, you know, when my daughter was um, seven, eight years old. I'm living across the street from the school she went to. I'm literally three blocks west of my job, four blocks west of the babysitter. Even if my car broke down, nobody was going to miss a day. Like you couldn't tell me I didn't have my stuff together. I'm paying all my bills. I have my support system. I'm golden. Right. And then here comes Mr. Right. Number two. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So here I am feeling like I've been well versed in the, you know, verbal abuse, um, physical abuse, you know, a little bit of, you know, sexual abuse, um, definitely, you know, financial abuse, Um, not really labeling it abuse, just, you know, the hard knocks, the hard lessons is what I called them being taken advantage of, not maybe being naive, allowing my feelings to blind me a little bit, you know, giving people too much of the benefit of the doubt. I really wasn't deeming it abuse at the time Uh, because, you know, you're young, you don't know. So in my later 20s, you know, here I am now um, with with Mr. Right number two and pregnant. And he was offered a job outside of the state and asked if I, you know, wanted to go along. And of course, getting out of the neighborhood is like success number one, right? So of course, and then plus we're growing the family. And, you know, I had, I had met the mom, the parent, the um, sisters, the brothers, the friends, the co-workers. I didn't, there was no red flags. Everything was beautiful. And, you know, we got into arguments, but there was nothing for me to worry about. And so seven months pregnant, I drive over a thousand miles away to get settled into our new place. And about three weeks after my arrival is when our personal belongings arrived. The three weeks that I was there, I was, you know, getting my daughter settled in the new school, finding my new doctors, getting to know the neighborhood, you know, filling up the kitchen, doing things that I'm supposed to do. And when um, our personal belongings arrived out of excitement, you know, I'm putting stuff away, trying to hurry up, get nested and all that kind of stuff. And I find belongings to another woman. And my heart is beating out of my chest. My eyeballs are popping out of my face. And I'm like, oh, hell no, you have got to be kidding. And I was like, okay, just you know, think, did he have friends? Did he have family? Was there anything here? Like, don't go to the worst, like let the day go. And I just, I continued unpacking. Of course I'm haunted, taunted all day. Uh, I pick up my daughter, I make dinner. I like everything was as normal. And that evening when she, you know, went to bed, I said, okay, I have, I have to talk to you about something. You know, when I was unpacking and putting stuff away, I came across the stuff belongings of another woman I need to know what's happening and he was like oh you were going through my stuff I said going through your stuff you didn't hear me say I'm putting my stuff away and I came across it and before I could even finish my sentence he was already had me on the floor was straddling my pregnant eight-month belly with his left hand around my neck and his right fist closed hand punching 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 and I'm squirming and all of a sudden I hear my daughter's voice at the top of the stairs the voice I've never heard of fear from my daughter, mom, mom. And I just remember this like heat rushing through my body, the adrenaline that is like only heard of, but rarely experienced. And I felt it gushing through my body. And I just went, that's my daughter. And my feet slammed on the floor and my hips thrust towards the ceiling. My neck is used as a kickstand. The guy rolls over the top of me. I have no idea how I popped up on my feet so fast. I run around the couch. Her little foot is coming off that last stair. I grab her hand and we run out the house like that barefoot in pajamas with nothing. Okay, so I'm looking around like who has a light on? You know, it's like almost 11 o'clock at night. I'm pounding on the door, ringing the doorbell. Please, please, please. I need to use your phone. Thank goodness they had kids. Like, I'm sorry if I woke them up. Can you please put the kids in the other room? Um, I need to, you know, call the police. And (laughs) what seemed like forever, you know, I'm just after I hung up with the cops, I'm just bawling and bawling and bawling. I couldn't even breathe. And I'm just like every single thing that I left every single thing that I know is gone. Like I left my family. I left my friends. I left my neighborhood. I left my support system. I left my community. I left everything. And now I'm here where I know nothing, no, no one, not even the laws. Like I 
was completely in a foreign place and knew nothing. And, you know, the cops did arrive. Of course, I gave my story. By the time they got there, my head already had these blood blisters, purple. I mean, the pictures were very clear and, you know, there's so much to say after that. There's so much to say after that. I want to share that that was 20 years ago. And, you know, <laughs> I didn't even know if if my unborn child was okay. Like I literally had to wait until the next day. I chose, I chose to wait until the next day because I wanted to protect my daughter as much as possible. I wanted to drop her off at school, allow her to have a regular day. That gave me six hours that I had to check in at the emergency room to make sure my unborn child was okay. If I needed to pull stuff off of me or out of me by two o'clock, that's what I was, what I was going to do because I needed to pick up my daughter from school. I had no support system where I was at. So my mama bear mode and adrenaline mode kicked in and took over. And that extreme independence that you were talking about is um, where most of this derived from. And I believe that if I did not have the rough upbringing of learning how to work for myself and find for myself and provide for myself, I don't think I would have had the tenacity to be able to feel or do or have the strength to do it again, but this time on such a higher level because it wasn't just for me anymore. It's for me and my two children. I'm all that they had. I don't even know where to jump in and and start with uh, your life. And, and first of all, just um, yeah, I'm gonna say sorry. I, I mean, and that's not really what I mean, but sorry that you've gone through that. And and Mike has children. I have two two daughters. And uh, just listening to your story just goes to my kids and hope and pray that they can find someone in their life to treat them with love and respect. And, uh, and then in listening to your story and knowing that there's 12 million people in the U S at least, and it's probably double that, unfortunately, that go through some sort of domestic violence every year, uh, in our country. And that's why I was just, um, honored to have you on the show because you know that there's so many people out there that uh, need some guidance and need to find the light. Uh, and I'm glad that you're out there and you've had the, the strength and the courage to endure uh, everything that life has thrown out you at you to be able to now have your new nonprofit confronting domestic org to be out there um, to be a source of light for people that maybe are just sitting in the darkness, like, like you were. Uh, and yeah, I totally, man, your, your life starting out right out of the gate. Your story is just incredible. You know, and you said, yeah, you were born into darkness and then hearing your story. Yeah. And then just seeing you now and seeing your new logo behind you and seeing everything that you're, that you're, you're doing. Um, that's the, the main thing I, I kept writing down, you know, what is it, that drives you. And I know you just talked about your extreme independence that you had growing up from being a, a, a youth who had to figure life out on her own. But right now, you know, what is, so your, your nonprofit is new. Um, but what is that that just drives you to be so passionate uh, about what you're doing and making a difference in, in the lives of the, the women and men uh, probably that you're helping um, through your your nonprofit. Well, you know, I will chalk all of that up to choice. You know, you I mean, to simplify it, you know, you could be bitter or better. Right. Mm. <laughs> and it's it really is a choice. And, you know, I could sit here and say that I'm a victim of so many different things. But, uh, you know, to me, I have an understanding of like, you know, victim, when you're a victim, it's you are in complete devastation. You cannot wrap your head around what just happened to you. And it was completely out of your control. Maybe it was, you know, because you are so devastated because you had love for whatever environment caused that trauma, um, you know, but it's it's 
you can you can be that victim, but how long you identify yourself as a victim is where things come into play. Because once you get through the phase of devastation, of confusion, of, you know, why me? And you get to the place where you're like, okay, I had no control. There was nothing that I could do about it. There's nothing different I could have done to mitigate or prevent. You know, then you're then you're transitioning from being a victim to being victimized. You realize you were victimized. And then as you go through, you know, some other healing factors and and, you know, time, of course, allows these things to take place. And I have, you know, particular programs like you shared earlier that helps you get through these phases quicker. But you realize that you're becoming a survivor when you're able to share your story and talk about the the intelligence and the strength that you got from that situation in your life from that hardship from that trauma and that's where the ptg comes into play because i could sit here and say i have ptsd around a lot of things as well especially the smell of that man's cologne you know um, those are triggers and you have the ability to intercept a lot of it it's getting to know where these emotions live within your body because you go through a physiological change when you're triggered there's good triggers like your favorite song and there's bad triggers like a particular scent you have a physiological change and once you recognize that you're experiencing that change you are at your highest level right there of control of empowerment, because you have then at that moment, the choice to respond opposed to react. It's being in tune with who you are and who you are not. And then identifying what is your end goal here? You know, sometimes the best option is to retreat and then come back later when you're level headed. Sometimes the best option is to confront. Confront is not a negative thing. Confront means you care enough and you are seeking resolution. So <clears throat> going back to, you know, what drives me and, and what makes me want to give back is that I feel like I was handed the short end of the stick without a choice. And just because my, you know, my parent did what he felt he needed to do under, you know, being responsible for me up to the 17th or 18th year of my life, it's my job to raise the, me beyond that. After that, I need to raise myself. And even though I started raising myself at a much younger age, you know, I just didn't want to repeat those patterns when it came to my children. And I believe that my children is what made me open my eyes and become a person of worth, of value, of need. These little bodies and mouths need me. So now I have something to live for and to give back to. And <laughs> listen, it wasn't it wasn't easy. You know, trauma affects you in different ways that you do not even realize. And me not having anybody in my life, never going back home after that situation, just staying in that foreign space and going to other foreign spaces to stay private um, and protection, protective over my children, it was a tight ran ship. And I'm here to tell you that when my daughter was in her later 20s, she said to me, I appreciate you being so close all the time. Heck, you were a helicopter mom. I could barely get away with anything. You caught me up every time. She said, I could reach out and touch you at any given day, any given time of the day or night because you were always there. She said, but emotionally, mom, I could not even phase you. You were never emotionally there. You were never emotionally available. And that was like daggers to my heart, my soul, my gut. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? How dare you? Blah, blah, blah. But honestly, she had she had merit to how she was feeling. This was a love language for her was more emotional. And that is not my love language. I had to learn it together. Her and I, when she, after she shared that with me, I had to do a lot of looking at myself. Why am I not emotionally available? You know, and it's not just because I'm so overprotective of my kids, but I'm overprotective of myself. No, how many times am I going to trust somebody and be burned or be hurt or be taken advantage of that? That guy was a silent narcissist. He made sure I had nothing left and was completely dependent upon him. I didn't know about narcissism. I only knew about violence outside. That was mostly physical and verbal. So to be with a silent person that navigated and moved that way to where they strip you of nothing and complete isolation, where you are solely dependent upon them, 
and then to take your life and my life and my um, these two lives into their own hands. I don't know who I was dealing with anymore. So how can I trust again? The only thing I could trust is me and raising my kids. And so as a parent, you know, how are you emotionally feeding your children? What you're doing, how you respond to these un foreseeable challenges, especially COVID. Since COVID, domestic violence has gone up incredibly. Resources have disappeared incredibly. And, you know, for a lot of parents who had to start working from home and then the kids who had to do, you know, school from home, how was that friction? How was that tension? You know, and even if it was something then, you know, how has it been corrected now? Because you can you can tell your kids one thing, but what you do how you talk and how you move is what they're learning. Mm. Ooh, man. So your daughter, I just, I'm still just taken back. You know, I think you said she was 21 or in her early twenties and just telling you that you've never been emotionally present. And I'm guessing at that time in, in your life, you were thinking, Hey, just Maslow's hierarchy of needs of just overall safety, you know, uh, of just trying to not to keep things simple, but I got to just have the, my foundation of, are my kids safe? Am I safe? And in your mind thinking, Hey man, life, we're safe. You know, I'm, I'm able to see them and I'm able to, to take care of them and provide and get them, you know, the, the resources that they need to, to be healthy. And then for your daughter to tell you, You've never been emotionally present for me. And then for you, and I'm sure, yeah, that just hurts you so bad. But then for you, and I don't know how long we won't, we don't need to get into it, but then for you to just have that love of your kids so much to be like, whoa, let me just take a step back and listen to that. And then to figure out instead of getting upset and instead of, you know, causing that to trigger you to shut down. And knowing that you have so much love for your kids and you've made these sacrifices to, to get yourself in a safe place and then to get that and then say, all right, wait, that's just one more thing for me to figure out because I do love my kids and she's given me information. And I can either make the choice or not. And just like you shared with before, you realize that you had a choice to make and to make that choice. And hey, what is your love language and what is mine? And all right, let's figure this thing out. And so I would love to just end this little segment right here is how's your relationship now with your kids? Oh, well, it's actually it's beautiful. My daughter and I have been working on this for about seven years now. It was not easy in the beginning. She actually thought I was being sarcastic because she wasn't used to me showing her form of love language. Um, but we read the book, you know, and we took the test and my love language is of service and hers is more of like the affirmation and, and, you know, the physical. So, you know, when I was giving that to her, she was thinking I was sarcastic and I was like, listen, either you want this or you don't, cause you're going to push me away. <laughs> so either accept it, like understand that it's authentic, that I'm really trying here and embrace it and we can have something great. Or we just go back to what we know. It takes both parties. It does. It really does. And, you know, right now we are, we are solid. We are fantastic. Uh, you know, we can cry and laugh all in the same conversation. And, you know, we have really done the, made the efforts and have done the steps to be close and have a, a mutual love and respect where there isn't those, those hard feelings anymore. And I'll share with you about a year and a half ago, I was in a life-threatening car accident resulting in only a 1% chance of me surviving. I'm still, I'm just supposed to be coming out of rehab right now. But while I was there, I was fighting for my life again. And I felt a higher power fighting for me as well. And again, it was my kids that I had on my mind and in my heart and my, my spirit while I'm thanking my creator for, you know, sparing my life to get the heck up out of there and and be be mom i i don't i it's sad to say but it's not sad to say that it's like i don't know anything really bigger than being that mom because i've had to be that mom sole provider and protector for both of them their entire lives and from that accident i realized 
because I've been under a rock 26 years. I've never had social media, MySpace or anything. I didn't want to advertise my life while I'm protecting and providing for my children. And since the accident, I have both of their blessings to share our story, to give back. And, you know, based on what I went through when I was in that victim stage, there are not a lot of real time resources. And I stood in line for food stamps, for shelter, for a lot of different things that I that I was some I was able to get and some not. But this nonprofit that I have today is to help real time victims and their children relocate when they have a safe place to go, but not a means to get there. And I think that that is like step one. As soon as you have the 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 acknowledgement that you're in a unsafe environment and you're ready to go and you find the place, family, friends or wherever to start fresh, you and your family, your children deserve that second chance. And it shouldn't take a hospital bed or ICU or near death experience to realize that. And when you have the courage to get up and go, you know, we're here. Love it. But I want to take a step back because you talk about having the courage to get up and go. And I don't mean to sound naive, but sometimes I think just in life, I'm not going to use domestic violence. I, I don't have any um, experience um, personally of, of being in that space. So I'm not going to pretend that I know anything, but I think sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. And we think that perhaps things uh, are normal. So what are for somebody listening who perhaps is not in like, uh, I don't want to say healthy because who knows? I think everybody has a different version of what that potentially could mean. But what are some red flags, some warning signs of somebody listening uh, of someone who might be experiencing a type of domestic violence um, that then, hey, well, that kind of I might be in that space and let me reach out to Garcia uh, and see if she can help me. Absolutely. There's so many. I mean, we can just start with, you know, are you finding yourself sad and crying more than happy and joyful? Are you afraid to go home? Do you avoid conversations because you feel like it will result in something extremely negative to the point? where you're feeling like you're a grain of sand. Do you have to ask permission to be an adult and go places or be with family or friends? Do you have to ask for money? Do you do you have to feel do you do you feel isolated? Do you feel like you are not able to be yourself? And are you being gifted things that are then later thrown in your face or asked for it back? Are you being gifted things in a way to, you know, coerce you into doing things you typically would not like to do? Do you feel dirty? Do you feel disgusted? Do you feel angry based on your own decisions and behaviors that you're doing, knowing it's outside of you for somebody else? And are you feeling like somebody is like asking you who you're talking to, who you're texting, who's on this social media? If there are trust issues, if there are doubts, if you're constantly finding yourself outside of who you are, these are all big red flags. Mm, mm, man. And again, the website for A. Garcia's new nonprofit, Confronting DV. Dot org o r g domestic violence so confronting domestic violence dot org but it's just dv uh, and then I hope it's a good site I'm gonna put it out there and you can tell me that just yeah we got no affiliation but in researching this I, I did want to be able to offer something so I just went to National Domestic Violence Hotline and they have the hotline dot org it seemed like a great site. Um, from looking at it. I don't know if you're familiar with that site, um, but wanted uh, people to have that as well. Just the hotline.org and a number uh, 800-799-7233. It's a 24 uh, seven number. They have up to 200 uh, different languages that they can accommodate. Um, and if you're in that space, meeting any of those criteria, uh, it's a wrong word, but criteria that uh, uh, Garcia just went over, then reach out and the time is now. Oh, that's right. Um, man, I don't even know where to go here. I'm just, uh, I'm a little bit overwhelmed. Uh, let's, let's change it. And then we got to get ready to go because we're almost wrapping this up. But I do want to ask you, you know, what's, what's, What's the best thing outside of the space that we've just been talking about? Just talk about you personally. What's the best thing you do for yourself right now? 
that just gets you in a great space to be able to go out and serve others that where you kind of recharge and reignite uh, just what you need. Yeah. Thank you for asking. You know, I do make sure that I take four breaks specifically for myself throughout the day. I set up a morning time for myself where I reflect on or not reflect on, but I'm planning out what do I want to do in my day to day specifically for myself and or others to show gratitude, to show appreciation and to be connected. And then later in the day, I'll set another you know, time for myself to be grateful for the certain things that I have and not to complain. I really try not to, I really try to avoid complaining. It doesn't change anything. Nobody really cares. It's just a part of life. It's how you deal with it. And then my, um, my other alarm or time that I set for myself is reflecting to make sure that the way that I carry myself or the way that my core beliefs is how I carried myself throughout the day, right? So if I believe in a positive attitude, if I believe that you can intercept your your negative inner critic and that you can respond to people who trigger you, even in your (laughs) most challenging moment, then you are walking in your belief system. Because right then and there in that moment when you're checking yourself, if you're not, then then that's a gap, a gap that is up to you to fill because it's it's you. Nobody knows you better than you. And then at the end of the day, I really do reflect on the entire day, making sure that I was able to show my gratitude to somebody or connect with somebody or make a difference somehow. Make sure that I, like I said earlier, walk in my belief system and also see how I can do better based on any missteps that I took throughout the day and how I can be better tomorrow. And I just always make sure that I tell my kids and, you know, my, my, chosen family, how much I love them every single day, no matter what. Mm -hmm. I love it. Last, last question. There's a great quote from John Alston that says, the only thing you take with you when you're gone is what you leave behind. So let's fast forward 50 years for you because you're still a young woman uh, and you're on your deathbed now and you're surrounded by your kids and grandkids and great grandkids and people that you've served and you're getting ready to take your last breath, what is it you want to leave behind? The ability to level up your coping skill, to live in your head and peacefully, no matter where you go in this world. I love it. Pashito, get us out of here, baby. Wow. Usually I, I'm pretty quiet. Usually I'll ask a question or two, but I don't want to take any of your time. That's an unbelievable story. And uh, to see that you've made it out to the other side with a smile on your face, infectious energy, you got an infectious laugh. And I'm just thankful that you're out there to help other people that might be going through similar situations. So keep up the great work. Uh, Thank you for doing it. We need more people like you. Really do appreciate it. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. All right. Again, you can find A. Garcia at BeYourIncredibleSelf.com or her new nonprofit's website, ConfrontingDV.org. And yeah, Pasho uh, did a great job. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate uh, you taking time. I know you got stuff going on off air. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, listeners, but she had craziness going on. And here she is just so cool, calm, and collected and sharing her incredible story. Uh, And listeners, thank you again for tuning in to another episode of Life's Essential Ingredients. Boom, baby. That just happened. We out.